Hello. In this video, we'll study inverse trigonometric functions. We'll begin by restricting the domain of sine, cosine, and tangent so that it is even possible to define what the inverse functions of sine, cosine, and tangent are. We'll then go over many examples of evaluating inverse trigonometric functions and see what happens when you compose trigonometric functions with inverse trigonometric functions. So remember that if you are given a function f of x, the inverse function f inverse of x is some function so that the composition of f with f inverse of x always produces x regardless of which order you do that composition. In other words, if x is plugged into one of the functions and that output is then fed into the other, you end up back at the x you started with. They undo one another. We want to define inverse functions for sine, cosine, and tangent. What we will deal with is arc sine or sine inverse, arc cosine or cosine inverse, and arc tangent or tangent inverse. It's possible to use these functions to then talk about things like arc secant, arc cosecant, but they are vastly less commonly used. Arc sine, arc cosine, and arc tangent, however, do come up quite a bit. One reason we're going to want to introduce these functions is so that we can solve certain problems for angles, and we'll see examples of this. So, for example, suppose that sine of theta is 0 0.4. What is theta? So here's how the arc sine function would be used for this problem. We begin with sine of theta equals 0 0.4. Now, if the left side equals the right side, I can feed them into the same function and get the same thing out. And we're going to feed sine theta and 0 0.4 into the arc sine function, specifically because arc sine and sine will undo one another. So on the left, the arc sine of the sine of theta is just theta. That's why we used the arc sine to cancel out the sine. So we have theta, the angle, is the arc sine of 0 0.4. Plugging this into a calculator gives us 23.58 degrees or 0 0.412 radians. So what do we do? We interpret the arc sine of 0 0.4 to be an angle whose sine is 0 0.4. But the full situation is not quite what's above, it's more complicated. There are many, infinitely many angles that have a sine of 0 0.4. For example, it is true the sine of 23.58 degrees is 0 0.4, but so is the sine of 156.42 or 393.58 degrees. So these angles all have a sine of 0 0.4. How did we know to evaluate the arc sine of 0 0.4 to be 23.58 degrees rather than one of the other ones. Now the reason for why we pick 23.58 degrees has to do with how we technically define the arc sine function and similarly the other ones in the first place. So let's get to that issue. So let's discuss one-to-one -one functions. In order for there to be an inverse function, a function has to be one-to-one. -one. That is, its graph has to pass the horizontal line test. Any horizontal line can only intersect the graph at most one time. But sine, cosine, and tangent are all periodic. Therefore, they very, very much fail the horizontal line test. Here's the graph of sine x, cos x, and tan x. If you draw horizontal lines, it's possible to intersect the graph infinitely many times, definitely more than once. So these graphs all fail the horizontal line test, so you might think there is no inverse function, and that's technically true at this stage. To get around this problem, we're going to limit the domain of the function so that it is one-to-one, -one, while still having the full range of the original. For the sine function, we're going to restrict our domain to minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. That produces this portion of the graph in red. Observe that horizontal lines either intersect this graph now, not at all, if they're above 1 or minus 1, but between 1 and minus 1, any horizontal line will intersect the red portion exactly once. So this red portion does pass the horizontal line test. So here is a picture on the right of this new restricted version of the sine function. It's the same as the sine function, but with this artificial restriction that the domain only goes from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. For the cosine curve, we're going to restrict from 0 to pi. Had we restricted from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, we would just have one little hump, but that would still fail the horizontal line test. This portion of the cosine curve, however, now passes the horizontal line test while still representing a full range from 1 to minus 1. And here's a picture of what that would look like on the right. For tangent, we just want to take one full branch, and we're going to take the one from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, this central one right here. 
And there's a picture of what that restricted version of tangent looks like. So all of these restrictions could have been done other ways, but this is the standard way to do it. The idea is to now pass the horizontal line test while not losing any possible y values. So we have the same range from minus one to one for sine and cosine respectively and all real numbers for tangent while now passing the horizontal line test. So now that these pass the horizontal line test, they're one to one and we can invert them. So after restricting these domains, we can make inverses. And we define the inverses of those functions to be arc sine, arc cos, and arc tangent respectively. So the domain of the inverse sine function is the range of our restricted sine function, which was from minus one to one. Conversely, the range of the arc sine function is the domain of our restricted sine function. And we restricted the domain to go from minus pi over two to pi over two. So if we say theta is the arc sine of x, what we mean is that theta is an angle whose sine is x, and more specifically, it's an angle between minus pi over two and positive pi over two. In other words, the angle must be in quadrant one or four. Similarly for cosine, the domain of the arc cosine function is the range of our restricted cosine, which is from minus one to one. The range of arc cosine is the domain of our restricted cosine. That was from zero to pi. So we interpret this as meaning theta being arc cos of x means that cos theta is x and that angle theta is between zero and pi. In other words, it's in quadrant one or two. And for arc tangent, the domain of the arc tan function would be the range of our restricted tangent. That was all real numbers. The range of arc tangent will be the domain of our restricted tangent. That's from minus pi over two to pi over two, not including those endpoints. And so what we mean by theta equals arc tan of x is that theta is an angle whose tangent is x and theta is in quadrant one or four. It's worth pointing out the domain restrictions on arc sine and arc cosine. The domain of arc sine and arc cosine are the ranges of sine and cosine from minus one to one. So you cannot plug, for example, 1.1 or negative two into an arc sine or arc cosine function. The arc sine of 1.1 would be asking, what is an angle in quadrant one or four whose sine is 1.1? There are no such angles. Sine can never be larger than one. Similarly, arc cosine of minus two would be asking, what is an angle in quadrant one or two whose cosine is negative two and there are no such angles? The outputs of inverse trigonometric functions are angles. For example, arc sine of one half. If we let theta be an angle, which is arc sine of one half, then the sine of that angle is one half, and specifically theta is in quadrant one or four from minus pi over two to positive pi over two. So theta being arc sine of one half is asking what angle in between negative and positive pi over two has a sine of one half. Now, since the sine is positive, we are in quadrant one, not four. And pi over six is the angle in between zero and positive pi over two whose sine is one half. So the arc sine of one half is pi over six. The arc sine of one half is the angle in quadrant one or four whose sine is one half. Another example, what's the inverse cosine of zero? If we represent theta to be the inverse cosine of zero, that means cosine theta is zero and specifically we are in between zero and pi. So what's an angle from zero to pi whose cosine is zero? The only such angle is pi over two. Arc cosine of zero is pi over two means pi over two is an angle from quadrant one or two whose cosine is zero. Let's evaluate the following. Arc sine of zero, arc cosine of minus root two over two, and arc tan of one. So if we let theta be the arc sine of zero, what that means is that the sine of theta is zero and theta is in between minus pi over two and pi over two. The only angle in between minus and positive pi over two whose sine is zero is the angle of zero. So the inverse sine of zero is zero. For B, let's let theta be the inverse cosine of minus root two over two. In other words, theta is an angle, its cosine is minus root two over two, and we are in between zero and pi. Three pi over four is that angle. 
Finally, let's let theta be the arctangent of 1. In other words, theta is an angle, its tangent is 1, and it's in between negative and positive pi over 2. Now remember, tan theta is sine over cosine. So tan theta being equal to 1 is equivalent to having sine theta equal cos theta. That way the ratio would be 1. What's an angle in between negative and positive pi over 2 where the sine and cosine are equal to each other? The only such angle is pi over 4. It's becoming pretty clear, I hope, that to quickly and efficiently evaluate these inverse trig functions, it's important to have a very solid understanding of your regular trig functions. If someone asks, what is an angle in quadrant one whose sine is one half, that's a standard value that you need to recognize as pi over six. So in this example, we have found that the arctangent of one an angle in quadrant one or four where the sine and cosine are equal, that's pi over four. These standard reference angles should start to become second nature to you. Another example, what is the arc sine of negative one half? So let's let theta be the arc sine of minus one half. In other words, the sine of theta is minus one half and we are in between negative pi over two and pi over two. This again is a standard reference angle. Since sine theta is less than zero, theta has to be in quadrant four. 11 pi over six is in quadrant four and sine of that angle is minus one half. However, this choice of theta is not in between minus pi over two and pi over two, it's too big. So we're looking for a negative theta. To be in quadrant four, but to be in between plus or minus pi over two, we're looking for a negative angle. So what's a negative angle coterminal to 11 pi over six? it's negative pi over six. In other words, instead of rotating counterclockwise by 11 pi over six, we would get a coterminal angle by rotating clockwise by pi over six. That's an angle of minus pi over six. So the arc sine of minus one half is an angle between minus pi over two and positive pi over two whose sine is minus one half. We've determined that angle is negative pi over six. Observe that the arc sine of a half, an angle in quadrant one, whose sine is one half is pi over six, and arc sine of minus one half, an angle in quadrant four, whose sine is negative one half, is minus pi over six. In general, for any value, the arc sine of negative x will be negative arc sine of x. Similarly, you can factor out a minus sign from the arc tangent function. But this does not hold for arc cosine. For example, let's find arc sine of minus root two over two, and arc cosine of minus root 2 over 2. For arc sine, we have earlier found in a previous example that the arc sine of root 2 over 2 is pi over 4. Therefore, the arc sine of minus root 2 over 2, the minus sign comes out, and we already know that arc sine of root 2 over 2 is pi over 4, and we just get minus pi over 4. But for arc cosine, we can't just pull out the minus sign. It's worth pointing out that arc cosine of root 2 over 2 is also pi over 4. Why can't you just factor out the minus sign? Negative pi over four is not in the range of the arc cosine function. Remember, arc cosine has a range of zero to pi. So if we just let theta be the arc cosine of minus root two over two, then what we're looking for is an angle whose cosine is minus root two over two, and we are in quadrant one or two, in other words, between zero and pi. The angle that solves that is three pi over four. There is something you can say about how arc cosine of negative x relates to arc cosine of x, but it's not quite as simple as just factoring out a minus sign. Now, what happens if we start composing functions with inverse trig functions? For example, let's try to solve three times the arc sine of five x equals pi. We're trying to solve for x, so Let's first begin by dividing both sides by three. Now we just have arc sine of five x. The first thing we did was got rid of that times three as a one step to getting x by itself. Now we need to get rid of the arc sine function. So let's take the sine of both sides. Now we just have five x equals sine of pi over three. Now we can divide by five and say that x is sine pi over three over 5, which evaluates to root 3 over 10. Now this cancellation property doesn't always hold. 
So here we had the sine of the arc sine. In the opposite order, it's not quite so straightforward. If you have an inverse trig function composed with its trig function, you can't always just cancel them out. So let's see an example. What is the arc cosine of the cosine of minus pi over 4? You might think that they just cancel and the result is minus pi over 4, but that's not quite correct. The arc cosine of something is an angle between 0 and pi. It can't be minus pi over 4. So just working from the inside out, what is the cosine of minus pi over 4? The cosine of minus pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. And we've already determined that the arc cosine of root 2 over 2 is pi over 4. So the arc cosine of the cosine of minus pi over 4 is actually pi over 4. In general, when you're composing these trig functions with inverse trig functions, work from the inside out and don't rely on cancellation laws that you don't necessarily know will work. Here's another example. What's the sine of the arc tangent of 3 halves? So as before, let's work from the inside out. Arc tangent represents an angle. So we're looking for an angle whose tangent is 3 halves, and specifically it's an angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So arc tangent of 3 halves is an angle, but its tangent is 3 halves. Because that's positive, tangent is positive in first quadrant. So let's find the sine of this angle. Draw a right triangle with an angle theta. What do we know about this angle theta? Its tangent is 3 over 2. So we can label the opposite side as 3 and the adjacent side as 2. This allows us to now solve for the hypotenuse of this triangle, root 13. Now we can state that the sine of the angle is opposite over hypotenuse, or 3 over root 13. So what is the sine of the arctan of 3 halves? 3 over root 13, which you could rationalize if this was required of you, but as I've said before, that's not something we focus on in these videos. Another example, what's the tangent of the arc cosine of minus one third? We're going to do the same strategy. Suppose you have an angle theta, the arc cosine of minus one third. We have an angle whose cosine is minus one third and it's somewhere between zero and pi. Since the cosine is negative, it's minus one third, we're in quadrant two. Then we're going to want to find the tangent of this angle. So let's draw a reference triangle. Here's our angle theta. Here's our right triangle, and we know the cosine is negative a third, adjacent over hypotenuse. So we have a minus 1 and a 3. Now we need to solve for this height. We're going to use the Pythagorean theorem. y is either plus or minus root 8, but we're in quadrant 2, so y should be positive. Observe that because we're in quadrant 2, we made our x value negative. So we put the negative on the x value, not on the uh, hypotenuse of the triangle. So since we're in quadrant 2, we pick y to be positive root 8. Therefore, the tangent of this angle will be the y over the x, or root 8 over minus 1, which is just negative root 8. Another example, can we write the sine of the arc tangent of u as a simple algebraic expression in u. Suppose theta is an angle representing arctan of u. It's an angle whose tangent is u, in other words, u over 1. So let's draw a reference triangle. We have some theta. It's either in quadrant 1 or 4, but for the purposes of our picture, we're just going to put it in quadrant 1. If I label those sides as u and 1, now since we are in quadrant 1 or 4, the x is positive 1. The y coordinate is u, which might be negative if we were in quadrant 4. Now we have a hypotenuse that we can solve for in terms of both 1 and u. The hypotenuse is of length root 1 plus u squared. So the complete triangle is as given here. Now we are asked what's the sine of the arctan of u. In other words, what's the sine of theta? So the sine of the arctangent of u is the sine of theta, which is opposite over hypotenuse, and there we have it, an algebraic expression that the sine of the arctan of any input u can now be computed as u over the square root of 1 plus u squared. Another example, let's simplify the expression secant of arc sine of b over 4. 
Again, we're going to let that inner inverse trig function represent an angle. So theta is arc sine of b over 4, meaning the sine of theta is b over 4, and theta is either in quadrant 1 or 4. So let's find the secant of this angle. So we make a reference triangle given that the sine of theta is b over 4. So here's theta. We put a b across and a 4 for a hypotenuse. This unknown side we label x, but we can solve for it using the Pythagorean theorem. x squared plus b squared must equal 4 squared. So x squared is 16 minus b squared. Now, because we're in quadrant 1 or 4, because we're using an arc sign, we know that the x coordinate must be positive. So we choose the positive square root here. Now, the cosine can be chosen to be x over 4, the square root of 16 minus b squared over 4. So we've solved that the secant of theta was 4 over the square root of 16 minus b squared. So the secant of the arc sine of b over 4 is always equal to 4 over the square root of 16 minus b squared.